I'm your host, Will DeGravio. On today's show, I am very excited to be sharing a conversation with Evelyn Kreutzer, a postdoctoral researcher and project leader of the digital video essay at the Film University Babelsberg. Evelyn is a Berlin-based video essayist um, and is a prolific curator of the video essay, theorist of the video essay, and has really been at the forefront of some of the most innovative and exciting projects and conferences uh, currently going on in the field of the of the video essay today. As always, you can learn more about the video essay podcast at thevideoessay.com and subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, notes on videographic criticism at thevideoessay.substack.com. Now here's my conversation with Evelyn. <laughs> to see you. How are you doing? So good to see you too, Will. This is a classic situation in which I've run to on the podcast before where I'm going to ask you questions that I already know almost all of the answers to because (laughs) I know you outside of the little podcast screen. Um, But this is one that I actually don't know the answer to because I know that you were part of the Middlebury workshop cohort back in the PhD year, which I think was 2017. But I actually don't know what your kind of early encounters with videographic criticism were and kind of what led you to to that point. So could you share with us? Yeah, what's your what's your origin story? How how do we get here today to this moment? <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, it's a very lucky accident um, that brought me into what turned out to be probably the most formative uh, e- single event uh, in my uh, in my academic career. Um, my professor, Jake Smith, at Northwestern, where I was doing my PhD at the time, mentioned this, this workshop, I think, a few days before the deadline. And he, he kind of mentioned it in passing uh, when we talked about sound studies and new approaches and sound studies and new approaches and digital methods altogether. And, and yeah, and so he just mentioned it in passing and I thought, wow, this sounds really interesting, but I hadn't heard about it. Um, and then I looked it up, uh, found all the information about the Middlebury workshop. Uh, and I was a third year grad student. So I really, I was a real greenhorn. I didn't really know, know my way around academic events and uh, email lists and all of that yet. Um, but I, but I decided that it was something I really wanted to apply to, but the deadline was, I think two days, two days away and you needed a letter of recommendation. And I almost didn't apply because I felt it was too embarrassing to ask a professor for a letter that close to the, to the deadline. But then I figured I'm just going to send a really, really apologetic email to Jake, to Jake Smith, who had, who had, um, informed me about the workshop in the first place and ask him if he'd consider still writing one. Um, And it worked out. I got into the workshop genuinely really having a very vague idea of what video essays were. I I wasn't familiar with that whole subfield of scholarship. Obviously it was at a different state in 2017 anyway than it is now. But what spoke to me was A, the possibility of doing creative work of going back to some kind of an artistic practice, which I had really been missing in in the first few years of my PhD work and B, this idea of not solely relying on the written word, the written or the spoken word to do film analysis. And, um, and yeah, obviously this workshop really encompassed both of those, those things really well. And I was so glad to get in. And what at Northwestern at that time was your 
like what what were you already thinking about what would ultimately become your PhD or like what were you generally interested in kind of researching like what at going into Middlebury what did you expect to kind of be working in as a in your scholarship Well I went into Middlebury with very vague to non-existent expectations <laughs> because I I really didn't know um <clears throat> what exactly it was going to be but I was at the time, so this was my third year of the PhD program. I did my PhD in screen cultures at Northwestern. It was the end of my third year. So I, I think I was preparing for my qualifying exams and my prospectus defense when I went to Middlebury. So kind of a, a crazy time. So I knew the general topic of my dissertation, which was uh, European classical music and music canons and American television, American media of the Cold War era. But obviously, I had come to that topic without any videographic concerns or exposure. So I came to Middlebury uh, with that topic at the back of my mind. But at the same time, I really wanted to take seriously this impetus that uh, Chris Keithley and Jason Mattel uh, informed us of, which was try to work on something on material that you're familiar with, but you, that you haven't studied thoroughly yet. So I actually decided to abandon my, my dissertation research for at least for those two or so weeks at Middlebury and focus on something somewhat different, but still marginally related. Um, and that's how I ended up working on uh, Fantasia, <laughs> Disney's Fantasia during that, that first week of Middlebury. Because it was, uh, and I, now I'm thinking it was really formative or it really makes sense with where my videographic work uh, went eventually. Uh, it's a film that I'm very, very intimately familiar with because I watch parts of it every single day as a child between the age of three and five, I think, it was my favorite movie. It involves classical music. It's relevant to my dissertation topic, but I didn't write about it thoroughly in the dissertation. I hadn't really thought about it all that much in an analytical sense. So it seemed, um, it seemed like an intuitive choice. And what, what creative practices like were you like, because you mentioned earlier that you had missed, you had felt that videographic criticism had kind of filled a void that you were felt like you were missing in academia. Like, had you been involved, like what, had you been involved in like film editing or filmmaking at all beforehand or music or like, yeah, like what, like, what, do, did you feel like you had brought any of that into your early videographic work? Because, I mean, I think we can see some of it now and in, in emerging in your later stuff. Yeah, so I was really serious about music when I was younger, in my younger oh. days. <laughs> um, as, a, as a child and as a teenager, I uh, was pretty serious about classical piano performance, and I my plan was to go to a music conservatory and study classical piano. That was kind of the, the roadmap for me for uh, like my entire childhood and my teenage years uh, until at some point I, and this is hilarious to me now because at that age, you're just, you have such a different sense of time <laughs> and your future. I think at some point it just dawned on me that I didn't just have to make a decision about what to study, but also what to do with that degree later on. And I realized that I didn't really want to be a pianist. I also didn't think I was enough of a prodigy <laughs> to, to really face, face that competition. I wasn't a prodigy at all is what I'm trying to say. Um, and I didn't really want to be a music teacher either. And in Germany, there's, um, we have a, a fairly different system academically than, than you do in the U S uh, you basically, you have to, you don't apply to a university or a college, uh, you apply to a specific program or a specific subject. So within the constraints of how, of how these subjects are set up in the German system, I could not have just gone to college and also study music as part of a general humanities degree. I really had to pick and choose and uh, and it just seemed too risky to me to go into a very specific artistic direction because I was also considering filmmaking and creative writing and um, and all of that. And instead, I ended up in a fairly um, general interdisciplinary 
humanities program in American studies and German literature. So quite quite different from what I initially set out to do, but kind of just to keep my, my options open, I think. And uh, as part of that undergrad degree, I spent a year at uh, UC Santa Cruz, where I got to take a few filmmaking classes, which I'd always wanted to do, film production classes. And that really fueled my, my interest in, in film practice at the same time as my, my theoretical interests went more and more into film and media studies. And when I started the PhD, I had high hopes and ambitions and fueled by a ton of naivete that I could do that on top of the PhD once I was there, only to find out that I was completely swamped with work and in coursework and definitely did not have that time. So coming to Middlebury, I had some film production experience, very limited though. And I had my my musical background, which also had informed my, my dissertation research. Uh, so I would say I came as a generally creatively, artistically inclined person, but by no means as a as an experienced filmmaker or editor or anything like that. To, to, to pivot a, a little bit here, your dissertation ended up including, in, in part, centers on the work of uh, Namjoon Pike, um, who we've talked about a little bit um, on this podcast. Um, I'm wondering... To, to just ask a very general question, I'm wondering, A, if you could just describe kind of generally what interests you about his work. I mean, I'm sure it's a million things. <laughs> um, but also generally now that you're, you know, to, to bring us up to today a little bit now that you're thinking about kind of videographic criticism, I'm wondering if you could talk about just his work in general in relation to either how you think about videographic criticism or kind of what we're up to today. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I think I can, th I can think of, of two video artists or, or of experimental filmmakers that I, I encountered or, or was exposed to quite a lot in the months leading up to the Middlebury workshop. And that was Namjoon Paik, who I was really just starting to do research on at the time and the other was uh, Martin Arnold, um, and uh, both of them. Like thinking about about their work now, I think they're absolutely like prototypical, inspiring, and and really foundational artists for everything that we do as video essayists now. Obviously, I mean, I don't think any of us have any illusions about having invented this, right? Like, <laughs> and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel uh, per se anyway. And, and I think that's one of the, the most interesting things to me about, about what we do is this lineage and how it connects to experimental film filmmaking and video art practices from the past, including, I think, the, the community aspect uh, that we talk about a lot. Uh, obviously, uh, Namjoon Paik was, was embedded in this circle and this really strong community of, of, of avant-garde artists in, in New York uh, in the 60s and 70s. Charlotte Moorman was, was one of the, the big figures there. Um, and Charlotte Moorman was actually the, the artist through whom I came to Paik, uh, more or less. Um, the, I was at Northwestern uh, when the Charlotte Moorman archive came to, to our special collections libraries. And um, there was a big exhibit at the Block Museum at Northwestern, where I ended up working for a year later on. Uh, so Mormon as the, this, this really important community figure, organizer, and of course, musician in her own right, who was very involved with the video art scene at the time, uh, was really interesting to me. Uh, and then I found out more and more about Pike, who is whose work is covered pretty substantially in art history books uh, and also in in certain musicology uh, texts, but his specific work for TV for TV broadcasts, not so much the the video art that's exhibited in in galleries and museums, but his experimental work with in the context of guerrilla television. Uh, uh, public television, local television, in, especially in New York and Boston, 
hasn't really been covered very much. And I found myself drawn to that the most because it, it, it showed TV as this really peculiar, interesting, wild field of experimentation in the 60s and 70s that I, that I didn't really know, know about beforehand. And of course, my interest in him came from both a music background and a TV studies or a media studies background, um, because he was a classically trained musician and composer. And he, he did a lot around deconstructing classical music canons, performance etiquette, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And those became, would end up uh, being topics that I explored a lot in my dissertation. And then Martin Arnold, of course, uh, in terms of, of method and uh, like, turning turning familiar images into robotic bizarre alienated fragments uh, uh it's it was just really fascinating to me it made me think about film theory in a completely different way uh and so once i started exploring videographic methods myself i i realized that there was a clear connection between the the, the work that i was already drawn to before and then the work that i ended up embracing in in my own methodology. I'm wondering how like in that time you think and I know this is a you know there's no one answer to this and it's it's a rather general question but I'm wondering having been a grad student being exposed to this kind of work like how have you seen it how how have you seen it evolve in the last kind of 6 years uh from your perspective because if I remember correctly from around the time, there was still maybe a sense of like, oh, this is maybe a little bit risky to do as a grad student in the sense that it's going to be like a deviation from what you should actually be working on and what will actually like, you know, improve your chances of getting a job. Like, do you see that changing at all? And and maybe this could be, you know, you're obviously familiar with a US context and a European context. So maybe you know that distinction is important but i'd be curious to hear your thoughts generally on on that development or lack thereof <laughs> I, I mean it's it's hard for me to assess how it developed in the years leading up to my my time in middlebury um so for me it seems that the the field has expanded exponentially within the last um two or three years in particular, but perhaps that's exactly how it felt or the speed felt similarly, or perhaps even faster in the years before I came to Middlebury. I, I, that's hard for me to judge, but I certainly get the sense that um, during, during the lockdowns, uh, during the pandemic, where our online communities became very active, um, certainly very active in what I got to see. And, and a lot of people produced work in new ways and perhaps also moved away more and more from just focusing on finished video essay publications, but also sharing exercises, fragments, works in progress, etc. That seemed to be really significant. And then I would say beginning with 2022, when the tra traveling became a little bit more manageable, I, we've seen so many events uh, all over the world dedicated to, to this topic. I mean, I remember in the first year or two after Middlebury talking to a few people about how great it would be to, at some point, to have a conference dedicated to it, perhaps even a a somewhat regular conference. And and it was it was this this dream and fantasy at the time, and now. I, I I can't even I can't really count the conferences anymore that um, that I've been to and that I hear of that are dedicated to it. So I think the communal and in person and organizational institutional framework in which in which this work is taking off since the pandemic. Um, not that we're over the pandemic, but uh, in the in the last two years or so um, has 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 been really incredible and and really fast. I think personally, um, I'm, I'm still somewhat unsure about where this will go in the future or how this community and network might change or might have to change. Or um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, as of now, 
I'm obviously, I'm really, I really enjoy how close this network is, how many friends I've made through this work, how, uh, how connected I am to um, really interesting, amazing people in my field across the globe, and that I get to see them more and more at these events now. At this, and I, and I'm, and I, every single event that I go to, I see a, a whole new b bunch of new faces as well. So it's def, it's not like we're just staying in a single bubble, which, which is great. But I also see a need for us to, or, it, or I, I see a risk that we might eventually stay too much in a certain scholarly context or, or a scholarly bubble, or, or at least I see a need that we need to open up these kinds of events uh, and, and our conversations to people who do video essayistic work outside of academia to, to audiences outside of academia. I, th I think this is, this is among all the methods that I've tried out in, in academia so far, it's definitely the one that lends itself best <laughs> to, to, to that kind of transference. Um, and I've shown a few of, of my videos at, at festivals where I was the only scholar and, and these conversations have been really illuminating as well. But I don't think we've 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 reached that that goal yet uh, completely, or or it's it's really difficult still to as much as this field is expanding and and taking off. I th I, I think it's really tricky and important to to build those bridges within you know within the constraints of career strategic uh, things that we need to consider. Um, Funding structures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. Uh, I think a, a lot of us are are quite familiar with that with that conundrum. Yeah, it's very interesting because, it, you know, we've talked about this before in the sense that, like, yeah, the 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 early stages of the of the pandemic, like the first couple of years, like forced us all into our screens, right? And through that, videographic criticism kind of went all these really exciting directions, and now we're kind of entering the seeing people in person more kind of phase. And so I think kind of what you laid out as a general kind of ambition and need for the field is I totally agree. And hopefully now that like that, you know, that's part of the roadmap going forward as we navigate like this new, uh, this new era, but that, that year known as 2020 um, and discuss um, a, a project that you worked on with um Ariel Avasar, um, the the first iteration, the first volume, as it were, of the Once Upon a Screen um, audiovisual essays um, that were published in fall 2020 in um, in the Cinephiles, um, which was a collection of of nine uh, audiovisual essays um, that kind of are have an academic bent to them, but also deal intimately with the personal that are exploring, um, in your own words, quote unquote, screen traumas, um, you know, the memories of, of, um, you know, watching scenes that terrified you. Um, um, a, a lot of folks, I think, you know, going back all the way to childhood. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll of course, uh, many people listening will be familiar with this series in one form or another. But, um, and of course I'll, I'll, I'll link to it at the video essay.com, but, I'd be curious to know generally how um, this special issue came about. Like, how did you and Ariel um, conceive of it? Um, and just talk generally about working in that time and 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 kind of I think that spirit of collaboration, of cross pollination, of yeah, uh, online community, as it were. Yeah, I'll, I'll, it'll probably be difficult for me to to keep it short uh, and concise <laughs> because a year the year twenty twenty was such a is is kind of a blur <laughs> in my memory. It's when I obviously when the pandemic uh, began. It's when I finished my dissertation uh, within a few months uh, and without access to libraries, no less. <laughs> um, and I moved back to Germany, kind of on a on a whim. It was yeah, it was it was somewhat somewhat crazy and uh i i kind of forgot forgot that once upon a screen happened at the <laughs> at that same time uh although we we began the process a year before i think um and it's 
it's it's really it's funny and interesting to me that beginning with Once Upon a Screen, uh, I I've I've somehow ended up in this, and I, I don't mean this in a bad way. <laughs> it's really interesting to me, but I somehow ended up in this as one of the the representatives of the personal mode in videographic. Uh, scholarship. And that's something that I'm still really, really interested in. But it's funny because I think as a lot of my friends and colleagues would confirm, I've always been really hesitant about inscribing my academic work with my myself, my identity or my background beyond, you know, something like I'm, I've am i always been into classical music, so I'm going to write about classical music. But I've always been quite wary of that. And perhaps in part, that's that comes from my, my, my German academic training. It's a little bit where that culture is a little bit different than than in the US. But also, to be honest, because it always felt a bit too personal and intimate to me to turn my my own personal experiences into public uh, public work or public academic work, public meaning submitting an essay to your professor. It's not, you know, it's not like, like I necessarily presented work in front of a lot of people at that time. Um, but so ironically in, in, in the videographic, uh, work, I was really drawn to, to the personal mode, not so much in, in the sense of reflecting on my, my identity or my, uh, my particular position in the world, my sense of self, but really about why I watch the films and the TV shows that I do. Why do I feel the way that I do when I watch them? And why do I study this in the first place? And I think most of us can immediately think of a few found really inspiring or or profound um, memories of, of watching a given film or TV show that they can point to now as, yeah, this is, this is how I got into what I do now. Um, and that's always been interesting to me. And I, it's, it's always been a little curious that in traditional ac academic scholarship, we're prone to hiding that, that motivation or that part of it. Um, obviously a lot has changed in that regard too, but with videographic work, you can hone in on it in a different way and also in a more performative way, you know, which perhaps takes away some of that, that vulnerability or, or intimacy that I was um, worried about beforehand. If you turn your, you know, if you can work with and on filmic memories, but you don't have to tell people if they're true, <laughs> um, you can be as performative as you want, um, within certain constraints, right? And so uh, when Ariel and I started talking about this, it was really just a, a little experiment between the two of us. We had, we had, I think we had met at SEMS in Toronto uh, in 2018, I want to say. And then we met again in Berlin at a, at a conference that Kathleen Loeb organized here in 2019, perhaps. I'm not totally sure when it was, maybe 2018 as well. And we we started talking about um, just, we were both really new to, to the whole thing. And we started talking about our, our interests and, and certain film memories and, and we're chatting about, about them uh, on Facebook afterwards. And I think we both just shared one of these foundational scary moments that we remember um, around watching a given film. And for him, it was Lord of the Flies. And for me, it was Psycho, um, which I really have a, a, a really, really scary memory uh, associated with Psycho from, from my childhood. So my, my, the, the video I made on the basis of that memory is, is not performative. It's true. Um, and so can, we, can you share what's, can you give us a tease of that if we haven't watched the video or without a spoiler or? Um, yeah. So uh, I watched Psycho when I was way too young for it. I think at 10 or 11. Uh, and uh, I think I watched it. I watched parts of it multiple times because I was always sent to bed early. Uh, and my mom asked me to, I, or I, I think I had to like close my eyes for the shower scene or something like that, but of course kind of blinked uh, and, and then tried to get a glimpse um, and it was the, because of the music, 
mainly. It was so scary to me it, that it haunted me uh, throughout the night. And uh, I, I went to sleep without, I think, again, like just having seen half of the film, probably I was probably sent to bed right after the shower scene, <laughs> which is, is not ideal. Um, and I just remember lying awake for an entire night after watching that film and staring at my door, which like it was, my door was opened a little bit. And I, I was convinced I saw the silhouette of Norman Bates, um, like this, the silhouette you see right after uh, he pulls, pulls the, the shower curtain. I, I was convinced I saw that in the door frame and I was absolutely frozen by, by terror. I couldn't, I couldn't move one inch and it was one of the scariest nights of my life. So, um, so actually like I, I, I remember feeling some kind of like trauma response in my body. I, 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 I kid you not. I had a trauma response in my body anytime I heard that music for years. Uh, and then I actually managed to combat that, to, to work through that trauma by, through my own form of exposure therapy, by watching it over and over and over again until it had lost its impact. And then it turned into one of my favorite films. Um, and and we, we can talk about my ambivalent feelings about Hitchcock <laughs> later on. But yeah, that's that's how the whole project came into being. We We really just decided, okay, let's both experiment with it, do a short video on, on these memories and share them with each other. And that was, that was it. And then, but then we really liked what we did and decided that perhaps this was an interesting prompt for other people in the video essay community. And, and then it kind of took off from there. We were astonished by how many people picked it up. Uh, we were really amazed by the responses we got to the, the first one soprano screen publication. And then, uh, yeah, we, we, we expanded the project with, uh, a second volume of, of, of two parts and that was published in transition, um, last year or beginning of this year. Uh, so it's, yeah. I mean, and of course it's been a, a really big moment for, for both of us, for our standing in, in this community. It's, it's, gotten us familiar with and with a bunch of people that we didn't know beforehand. It's really fostered both of our interest in collaborative projects and uh, co-authored projects and, uh, and how to play with the, not just use the personal mode or personal memories as a motivational force, but really play with this idea of memory fragments that can be both personalized and depersonalized and in my imaginary there's this this whole <laughs> this whole universe or this mosaic of cinematic memory fragments that are floating around and that we can kind of throw around and and hand each other uh, and and play around with and and that I'm still really interested in I'm wondering if you could describe just what the the process of actually editing something like that is, and in particular, like how you found or how you approach like giving feedback. Half of what makes Middlebury so great for everyone is that you work with people who are really good at making you do better without, and still encouraging you, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's something that comes with experience too, right? I, they're they're all uh, senior faculty who are really experienced in in what they do and who've worked with all kinds of students before. Uh, I don't have that level of experience doing that, uh, and I still find it like you find it difficult sometimes to navigate um, because obviously, I mean, we anyone who has taught film studies at a U.S. school at least, including myself, has worked with film production majors and has in one way or another given feedback on um, on creative projects before, right? So it's not like it's completely new to do that for us. Uh, and you still have to manage, find ways to come up with objective criteria beyond the um, specific subjective creative vision of a given project. Um, but of course, with videographic collaborative projects like Once Upon a Screen, where it's there's not a teacher-student <laughs> relationship, but you work either with 
you work with your peers, you you work, you give feedback to people who are much much more experienced in doing this than you. It it can be quite intimidating. But my approach, and I, I to be honest, I don't think I really ever philosophized too much about about that. Um, I I just did it. My approach has always been to uh, stick to to not make it objective, but to stick to my intuitive kind of give feedback in the way that I make video essays as well, which is a mix of that's my intuitive reaction. Here, I feel like the rhythm feels a little bit off. I can't tell exactly why, but perhaps you could try this and see if the rhythm feels better. Um, in addition to some level of um, more abstract analytical feedback, if, for example, an argument needs to be foregrounded a little bit more um, or less, uh, you know, aside from little technical things like the voiceover is a little unclear in, in this moment, um, right? But using using this intuitive, subjective understanding to open up a conversation more so than giving, you know, giving like professor student style feedback um, has has worked out best for me. What, what you described there recalls, I think, in, in thinking about your overall philosophy, as it were, to, to videographic criticism. Um, something you wrote with uh, Ioannis Binotto um, for the the journal ZFM um, and three issues um, on videography that you are uh, uh, co-editing um, with um, three other scholars the, the whom, with whom you organized a, a, a symposium um, last fall on the video essay, but what you wrote with Ioannis is called a manifesto for videographic vulnerability. Um, and again, I'll, I'll link to this for anyone listening, um, in the description below, um, which includes kind of, you know, a series of, of, of statements, um, as part of the manifesto and then kind of a written dialogue between yourself and Ioannis. So, um, I, love this so much and 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 return to it often um and have taken so much away from it so i'm i'm curious to hear how this um how this came about and how you went about collaborating um with uh Ioannis on uh on this i really just wanted to find some kind of an excuse to work with Ioannis uh that's uh, that's that's the short answer uh no i so i i think i met I, I, I've, I've known Johannes for a few years online, but I think we didn't meet in person until a year ago. Um, it's one of these collaborations that that have felt very strong and personal to me long before we, we met in person. Uh, and we ended up attending a few video essay events, which you were at as well, <laughs> uh, in Amherst and, uh, and in Hannover. And I just remember we having we we had a lot of conversations over in groups or one on one over lunch that somehow always came back to this idea of vulnerability and what felt vulnerable about doing this work, what was about vulnerability being one of the the core reasons why this community seems to be so strong and and, and well connected. Um, I mean, I, I really think both in my specific Middlebury experience, but in uh, what I've seen in the videographic community since, that there's something so deeply exposing and vulnerable about sharing, sharing this in intuitive um, or at least more intuitively motivated work than your regular conference talk uh, or, or written publication to sharing that with other people, let alone sharing uh, works in progress um, on a daily basis, such as in the Middlebury experience. There's something really personal and vulner vulnerable about it that bonds people together, that uh, creates community, that I think is probably one of the main reasons why I don't think I've seen or experienced any uh, animosities or, you know, uh, like 
negative talk behind people's backs in in this in this community of scholars, which is un, you know it's highly unusual <laughs> as far as I can tell. Uh, and and I think it's the it's the vulnerability that attracts us to to that work as well. And so given that this this topic came up again and again when when we were talking, and this also included thoughts about uh, kind of about what you asked me about before, how how does this vulnerability factor into teaching videographic methods uh, into your uh, feedback to students? Um, do you need to take out some of your vulnerability when you do that in order to keep up a certain hierarchy or is the opposite um, the right way to go? Uh, and because it kept coming up, we, and, and I kept thinking about it after, after the Hannover conference, I reached out to Johannes and um, and oh, also I should also mention that Johannes gave a really personal and uh, inspiring talk about vulnerability at the Hanova conference. Um, I don't think vulnerability was in the title, as far as I remember, but basically that's that that seemed to be the main point that he was getting at. And so I approached him and asked if we wanted to have a conversation about it and see if we could turn that into a publication, uh, sort of in the spirit of of this of collaborative work in in videographic scholarship. But I specifically didn't want to make a video this time, nor did I want to write a traditional paper. Uh, I thought the com coming up with a, a set of of guidelines, though of course not in an authoritative way, but um, but more as in a way of as as an encouragement, I would say. But then uh, recreating conversations that we had as conversations, you know, making that transparent that it was a conversation, and making our ambivalences transparent rather than presenting a finished argument that seemed to be. The right way to go, uh, and so that's that's what we ended up doing. And I'm really glad that it it seems to resonate with people. In the last Once Upon a Screen, or in the second Once Upon a Screen uh, publication that Ariel and I did, I submitted. We we had this collaborative approach to it, where people, the, all the contributors, submitted a short text about um, a formative screen memory. Uh, and we shuffled those those texts and redistributed it to to all the contributors anonymously, and so everyone ended up making a, a video essay about a memory that wasn't theirs. And I thought long and hard about which memory of mine I was going to submit to it, and I ended up writing a short text about a really personal traumatic experience of sexual assault from my teenage years. Uh, and I feel, first of all, I feel good about having done that. I, I don't regret doing that. Um, I also, looking back at it, probably probably didn't really consider too too much how that could affect the person getting getting this text. Um, I certainly ended up working or being in pretty close exchange with Julia Schönheit, who ended up making the video who's a good friend of mine. Uh, but that's something that I, I think earlier today, I, I talked about how I, I used to be really hesitant about inscribing any of my academic work with my, my personal um, experiences. And this is as far the other, <laughs> the opposite direction as it gets. Um, but I, I ended up doing that because I, A, from this perspective of really sharing memories with each other and taking account of how all the movies that we watch every, and obviously everything that we experience and see in life by extension is filtered through our specific memories and our memories in turn inform any of the scholarship creative work that we do. That's point B. Uh, and by virtue of those dynamics, and, and Susan Harewood actually just uh, wrote a really great piece about that that is going to be published in our videography uh, blog, which I will talk about in just a moment. By virtue of these dynamics, 
video videographic work of course is always inherently political is always inherently infiltrated by our personal um biases experiences uh etc but that's also the great potential um that i see in it and that that's what makes sharing even the most vulnerable experiences takes on uh the the things that we do creatively and academically makes it worthwhile i think thank you very much for um for sharing that and it's as as we mentioned it's it's published as part of um the videography section of uh zfm which is a a a, a three part series looking at um the uh, epistemological political and pedagogic pedagogical potentials of um the audiovisual essay and comes out of a uh, a conference um that you organized with um Kathleen Luke um Anna Sophie Filippi and, and Mikey Sarah Reinert um that was um videography art and academia and Hanover um funded by the Volkswagen Foundation um and so you've you've published thus far one of the 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 three issues and um you, you know two more on the way at the time of uh this recording and so just speaking generally because you know we could record hours talking about all, all of all of the things um what kind can you just kind of give us you know some some listening who hasn't been to that blog kind of what we can what we can expect and kind of what the aim generally is for um for this uh special section that the four of you are uh, collaborating on yeah so we one of them one of the many key points that motivated the four of us um, in setting up the, the the symposium in Hannover was to to bring together this international group of video video essay scholars that we knew with with German scholars with uh, German media studies and film studies and then as part of that also to connect more senior scholars with people who were new to the to the forum so it was the the overarching idea of this conference which was one of the first in person conferences af after the long hiatus uh covid hiatus uh was to bring together these groups of people uh international and local uh and experienced less experienced um so as part of that we set up uh, a pretty rigorous um, mentorship program through which we got to pair up uh, experienced video essay scholars with uh, with these mentees who were new to to the format, uh, who and some of who um, ended up publishing in this videography block, uh, and uh, and overall we we brought together this international web of people with some some of our colleagues from our own institutions uh, with the Film University Babelsberg and uh, Han the university in Hannover that Kathleen Loke is, uh, is positioned at uh, and, and see what kind of conversations would, would come out of it. And as part of that effort, we also wanted to use this, um, this platform to establish a specific video essay publication platform in the German context. Uh, a such a publication didn't exist until then. There are several journals and, and, and platforms in Germany that do publish video essay work, uh, such as research in film and history at the University in Bremen. But so far, there hasn't been a publication series just solely dedicated to this line of scholarship and, and work. So we decided to approach Zeitschrift für Medienwissenschaft, ZFM, the German equivalent of the Journal for Cinema and Media Studies, if you will, and uh, see if we could collaborate with them. And that's what we ended up doing. So we published the first issue a few months ago. The second issue is just about to be released now that we're talking, might already be out by the time that this, this podcast episode is released. And uh, we included uh, different different works by the people present at, at this conference, at the symposium, and um, uh, have, a, I think, a really interesting mix of 
mostly video essays, some without a creator statement, some with a creator statement, uh, as well as a few uh, text text publications that are focused on on video essay questions. And as part of this um, bridging effort between Germany and abroad, we made sure that the publication is completely bilingual. So it's published uh, both in English and in German, uh, which required quite some extra efforts <laughs> on our part to manage to, to translate everything into German. Um, but I think it's a it's an important gesture, at least, to to really um, open up that that dialogue with 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 scholars in the German speaking speaking world, which of course is not limited to Germany, um, but uh, obviously we have a few really key a key, few key players in Switzerland, for example. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the main motivation behind it. And it was really a fantastic event. And if you're listening now, you could go back to um, last November, the podcast published an episode called Openness and Videographic Criticism, which um, featured a discussion between the organizers and then also some reflections from those in attendance on this theme of openness, which we've talked about today. And I think that robust mentorship program um, that you all designed and executed was really just like very exciting and I hope um, is something that other folks can you know pick up that baton and, and run with it in other contexts. Um, there are so many other questions that I would want to ask you, but just I think now we should pivot to talk about one of your video essays kind of in more detail and I think we'll also be able to pick up some of the various threads um, that we've been um, going with. Um, and, and the video is one that you presented at the um, uh, video essay conference that was held at UMass Amherst um, last fall and has since been um, published in the journal Music, Sound, and the Moving Image um, with an accompanying statement. Um, and that is is footsteps. Um, and so I'm given that Hitchcock has come up and you mentioned your um, I, I forget exactly what the ambivalent was maybe the word that you used to describe or at least remember with Psycho. Um, I'm very curious to hear how this video came about, which essentially in, in, in the broadest possible sense deals with um, the sound of footsteps or a lack thereof um, and uses Hitchcock films as as its corpus. So take us before we dive into the kind of the nitty gritty. How did this how did this come about? To be honest, I don't remember how I first came up with, <laughs> with the idea. I except that I, I had always wanted to make a video on Hitchcock, but I'd always been really hesitant to do it because I didn't want to be that person that makes another video or produces even more scholarship on Hitchcock uh, for obvious reasons, <laughs> I, I think. But I ended up using using this as an opportunity to bring together a few of my key interests, which is sound, sound studies. Uh, I've, I've also always been working uh, a lot on music, but in this case, it's really just sound. And memory, cinematic memory, and of course, uh, Hitchcock, <laughs> which... Uh, I hadn't explored too much academically for obvious reasons, um, but was always um, one of the key figures in my own cinematic memory and my cinematic upbringing, which I'm sure I share with, with a lot of people. Hitchcock was the first director slash auteur that I really that I was aware of as a, as a child and as a teenager uh, whose films kept being shown on, on German television um, pretty extensively, more so than most of the other famous auteurs of, of the time. I don't, for example, I don't remember seeing Orson, any Orson Welles films nearly as often on German television as, as Hitchcock. Um, so in part, it's it's due to how broadcast programming worked in, in Germany in the 90s and 2000s. But 
but Hitchcock's also a director that both of my parents really loved, uh, especially my dad. So I was exposed to these films uh, fairly early on, <laughs> uh, perhaps a little too early, such as in the in that psycho psycho and scary psycho incident. And I just remember being really fascinated by those films, being very drawn into them. I think the music, especially the Bernard Herrmann uh, scores, played a huge role in it. But I can't think of any other director or any film set of films that uh, were as memorable to me uh, in, in those early years. And so definitely long before I thought about canon politics or tourism, et cetera, in a critical way, or thought about the representation of women <laughs> in Hitchcock films in a critical way. Uh, he was the like the big figure that I thought of when um, my interest in, in film came about. So whether I like it or not, <laughs> and I'm not saying that I do like it or don't like it, Hitchcock is very prominent uh, for me is key to to my interest in in what I do. So I always wanted to to work on him, but uh, I didn't really for the longest time I didn't find the right way to go about it. And then I figured, well, I'm actually I'm just gonna I'm actually gonna explore that very ambivalence by making this video. And I'm not I'm not even sure how much of that comes through. I think in some ways it could, come across as the most conventional academic textual analysis video that I've made. Um, but I'm actually, whether, again, whether it comes through or not, I'm, I was actually not nearly as interested in deeply analyzing Hitchcock's style um, and uh, the sound of Hitchcock as I was interested in engaging with why the sound of Hitchcock was so memorable to me and how that relates to not just my own, but I think collectively our, our fascination with watching films from, from the past, from a long bygone era. Uh, and the more I thought about it and, and revisited a lot of the, hit, of the Hitchcock films that had been most informative for me, uh, I realized, well, there's this there's this ur fascination with cinema replaying <laughs> the past in real time, right? Obviously, we've we've all uh, read about this and thought about this. Uh, and to me, from my earliest memories, this was attached to images of moving images of these actors on screen: Tippi Hedren, James Stewart, etc. But when I watched those films again, I realized that it was also deeply attached to sound including the most banal sounds and perhaps the most banal and the most prevalent sound in a lot of films is the sound of footsteps. It's usually the first sound that Foley artists record. It's one of the, the major elements of Foley art that uh, are added to, to the mix and that you don't really think about that. You're not supposed to think about while you watch the film, but that really make audible this replaying of the past in real time and the more I thought about it, I also thought about the fact that because it's Foley art, we're not really hearing T.P. Hedren's or James Stewart's footsteps from the past. We're hearing the footsteps that were performed by someone we're not seeing, a Foley artist who's invisible to us. So it, the, when I worked on it, I, I realized there are all these layers to that you can uncover just by focusing on this tiny, seemingly banal detail of of a film or of a set of films and that might take you into as I try to do into both an analysis of what sound does to the the psycho psychology of Hitchcock's films but also to the psychology of watching and remembering films on the most fundamental affective level your video, I think, really is obviously dealing with Hitchcock, but as you've alluded to, kind of decenters him or the or the figure of the auteur or whatever in a, in, a, in a really interesting way. Like when I watch it, it's it's of course about Hitchcock and using Hitchcock, but it's really it it's really not. I feel that it, it gestures towards 
so many things that are that are larger. Like in, in my memory of it from the screening and then in, in, in revisiting it, I had almost felt that what had stuck with me in in between watching it was even less the Hitchcock and more the sense that, oh, Evelyn was just looking for like a corpus of films. And so she returned to one that she knew well to kind of make this larger point about kind of sound. And as you say here, the, 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 the Foley art. And so I'm curious, I get the sense that, you know, how much of that you agree with, but also how much of that was conscious in kind of the actual physical editing of it and, and, and what you were gesturing towards. I mean, was that something you were, you were aware of in making it? It's really interesting for me to hear you, you say that because, um, that's, I, that's, that's a key approach in a lot of my video essay work that I've always been somewhat um, hesitant or careful about making explicit because I I'm always worried that it's gonna uh, it's gonna offend those video essay scholars who uh, who advocate for um, strongly for this analytical film scholarly approach. Um, using videographic methods to go deep into a given audiovisual text. Uh, and I've certainly made videos, perhaps most of, above all in my, my first video essay, Berlin Moves, uh, where I, I, took, I took liberties in kind of doing what you just described, which is I, I had a sense of what I wanted to express and I was looking for filmic material that spoke to that. So perhaps using or misusing uh, the filmic sources for my own purposes. <laughs> um, obviously it's not that black and white, but um, but in the Hitchcock video, more so than any of the other videos, I, I thought that I wasn't doing that <laughs> so much, um, but was, was really focused on this set of films. But of course, as you said, in this, not in the spirit of, I want to produce a radical new take on what Hitchcock did and wanted to do, uh, et cetera, but more so in the sense of this is a set of films that's been really influential for me, influential for a lot of people. Um, that's, that's part of the, the, the tricky thing about working on really well-known films, of course, is always that you, you can you can go right and wrong in so many different ways. You I you don't I certainly don't want to necessarily contribute to or reaffirm the canon politics and auteurist um politics that have gone into turning him into the figure that he is. Uh and perhaps I am doing that still by making another video about him. Um, but at the same time, these kinds of figures and films offer the chance of working with a language or a set of images and sounds that is familiar to a large amount of people and that allows you to to communicate with them through this shared memory or th shared language uh, for lack of a better better word um and that i think can also be empowering you know you can yes you can make a video about hitchcock by and reaffirm his canonical status but you can also make a video about Hitchcock and by doing so take ownership of that canonical material in, in some way and perhaps deconstruct it or as what I try to do, uh, make it your own and make it not about Hitchcock, but make it about, not about the figure Hitchcock, not about the director Hitchcock, but make it about the shared knowledge and memory of people who have watched Hitchcock's films. Right. So and in that sense, I think just as a woman making a film about Hitchcock, uh, including films that are deeply misogynistic and, and, and problematic. And of course, Hitchcock himself as a figure in Hollywood uh, is very problematic. But there is something empowering and um, perhaps bold about doing that, even when it seems on the surface, perhaps it seems like it's the most conventional thing to do. <laughs> I was surprised in revisiting it in the lead up to this conversation, like what, um, in 
in returning to kind of how you use the Hitchcock, like it, it to me, the video very much feels almost like a Chuck Workman esque kind of montage, in, in which in that very in kind of that avant garde found footage tradition of raw materials becoming new things, and that's what resonated with me. But then rewatching it now, like I was, I think I had how much analysis you are doing in the text and how much you are directing it towards like how the films actually function and how they're playing with it on an analytical level. Um, and so I'm curious, what was the relationship between kind of the text and the image for you as you were, as you were working on it? Because I, it, it would obviously be an entirely different piece altogether, but like I could imagine a version of this existing with, with no text and then it would take a very kind of um, a more art, art artistic direction perhaps and having the more kind of academic uh, writerly mode that we're seeing here. So what was the, what was the interaction and creative process like in that regard? I think as far as I can remember, it's the video essay that I've made in the most, uh, it, I think it's the video essay that I took the least time overall to finish. Um, I basically did it within, the, well, I, I did the first draft within a few days. I think obviously like with publication processes, you keep going back to it again and again later on and you change some details um, and like peer review processes will um, bring about new suggestions for edits, etc. But for the most part, I, I made it in a few days uh, and I I kind of did it, th this might sound obnoxious, <laughs> but I kind of did it in a semi-meditative flow-like state. Uh, you know, like sometimes, I mean, that's the state you always want to get to with creative work and uh, sometimes you do and m many times you don't. Um, and you can't always uh, force it <laughs> or, or plan it, but um, but that's how I felt when I when I did it. And I perhaps or probably because I am so familiar with with those films, I knew exactly where to go. And in each of them, they feel very familiar and personal to me. It's uh, I think I even I think I was staying with my parents for that week, so it was also returned to. <laughs> Um, to my childhood in other ways. I think I even, I was working on my mom's laptop as far as I remember. So uh, um, yeah, that was part of the experience. And um, I, I always edit very much from an intuitive rhythm focused um, point, point of view, point of listening. Uh, and I, did that especially in in this video Bec because it's about sound i decided not to use any voiceovers i usually work with voiceover quite a lot so this was um, a bit of a change uh, here i felt really strongly about not adding any of my own sound i also felt quite strongly about not um, overdoing it with uh, superimpositions uh, effects etc uh, i sometimes can in other videos can get carried away with trying to make things look pretty and aestheticize uh, my own experiments and interventions into the material here i felt like i really i wanted to keep it fairly simple and i wanted to keep the the text simple and the font simple i wanted to make it as make a video that was obviously that was interesting to uh, film scholars but also written or presented in a rhetoric that was not exclusive to, to that audience. And to be honest, and I, I, I don't know where this came from, uh, and it's funny to me now, I wrote the entire script with Mark Cousins' voice in my head <laughs> when, when I was doing it. It's like I, I find Mark Cousins' uh, voiceover, uh, voiceover so peculiar and... There's there's this interesting mix of pathos and apathy <laughs> um, that that I hear hear in them and and but probably mostly just because that's a voice I associate with looking at familiar 
uh, classic films and going deep into the material and describing, do, performing textual analysis uh, for the viewer, which is sort of what I did with my with my script. Uh, so I wrote it with with that voice in my head, which uh, I I doubt translates <laughs> into the finished product. Pro um, but all of this is to say that it's it all it was I worked in a good flow state. It was. It, it felt really smooth. I had, I think, about a week just dedicated to that where I didn't work on anything else. Um, and uh, yeah, I was I was happy with the results. I had a good idea of the scenes that I wanted to select and show. Obviously, I could have picked a whole other set of, of scenes from other Hitchcock films too, but uh, I had a fairly good idea of what I wanted to do, which doesn't mean that I didn't also see and hear all kinds of new um, new elements in in those familiar films when I when I made the video, of course. So I realized that I've I've been slowly working on this video and and a, a video of my own. And in rewatching yours, I realized that I totally stole several things from this video without even without even realizing it. And one of them is um, I think it's just generally interesting for me to how folks approach visualizing sound or how they um, approach in videographic work, either trying to really draw our attention to sound or an isolating sound. Um, and you begin by playing the sound of footsteps with a black screen. Um, when I see like a black screen like that, and in particular in this context, like for me, I always feel that it's a visualization of the inside of your head and get that it's a, it, it, it's, it's a memory. Um, uh, and I guess, yeah, just just generally, I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to how you think about uh, visualizing or not visualizing sound in 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 the video essay and kind of, you know, navigating the nuances of that, because I think it's a really interesting, just, just an interesting um, conundrum is not the right word. But uh, yeah, a, see, I see you nodding. So <laughs> roll with it. <laughs> uh bail me out here <laughs> uh for we for me the black black screen is always uh yes the all the elements that you just listed specifically memory but i to me the black screen is also always a reminder of the ontology of film um of individual film frames and the gaps that are in between the gaps that are in that exist in between uh individual fragments or longer clips as well. And the gap between, on a more removed abstract level, the gap between what was, what was made, what we're seeing, uh, how we're seeing it. And all of that factors into the way that I use black screens. In the beginning of the video, I also used it for a very banal reason, which is I wanted to draw people's attention to this sound first and foremost, isolate this, again, the seemingly banal background sound that usually doesn't receive a lot of attention, uh, isolate it, take it out of its, its visual context and um, play with or create a sound collage of collect these, is these isolated sounds and uh, create a collage um, from them. Um, of course, now thanks to Cormac uh, Donnelly, I I can think of many ways to do this much better on a technical level. I, I wonder what I would do uh, now if I did the video now. At the same time, I think it's also not isolating just the footsteps from the rest of the sound um, of the soundtrack is also more true to what I was trying to do, uh, even if it's uh, if it was based on a lack of technical knowledge. Um, so, so that was that was the the more practical reason. I I I knew I didn't want to start with an image. You know, most video essays start with images, <laughs> and we still we uh, sound people always love to point everyone else at the hegemony of the image and uh, alert people to the importance of sound. Um, I don't really think we need to do that that advocacy <laughs> anymore. But still, I, I I still think it's it can be useful and it can be important gesture to begin a video without an image and really focus in on the sound and especially 
be, because I had these three major elements, text on screen, image, and sound, uh, I didn't want to immediately overwhelm viewers with all three, or that's something that I was quite careful about throughout the video is to not overload the frame with too much information and to be careful about hierarchies between those three elements. So uh, especially since it begins with a memory in terms of the, the text, uh, I felt strongly about waiting um, a little bit until I began with, with images. And then later on, of course, it, because it's Hitchcock and those films are really well known by a lot of people, I also played around with ending clips abruptly or using black screens here and there to cut out iconic images and therefore um, raise attention to two sounds and to that iconicity uh, in my own way, including um, the shower scene. <laughs> hmm. Well, thank you for giving us a look behind the scenes. I don't think I'll be able to watch Hitchcock film without noticing footsteps ever again. Um, but to to kind of transition here as we as our conversation near its end, um, talk about a video made by uh, someone else. Uh, and I think this is a a really cool opportunity because it's a video that's made as part of uh, an ongoing project um, that you are 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 curating of of moving poems, um, as you call it. Um, and in this instance, I like to turn it over to you because you, you selected this video um, for us to us to talk about. So I'd be curious to hear a you just introduce it generally and also just um, of the the moving image poems that you've um, received. Yeah, why? Uh, why this one? Yeah, so the, the moving poems project is a, a side project that I've that I've been running for, I think about a year, perhaps, uh, that comes out of my own interest in poetry and video poetry and combining videographic work and literature poetry uh, also comes out of these experiences from the pandemic <laughs> pandemic era, uh, the TV dictionary exercises that a lot of us did of uh, really embracing quote unquote non-academic or non-traditional ways of making and sharing videographic work. Uh, so I think my own contributions to this project are probably among the least ac academic, again, quote unquote, academic um, and the most experimental, uh, also the shortest videos that I've made. And the, the, the but of course, the, the overall idea is to test out the comment, this, this relationship between text slash poetry and and video to ideally get in new insights about both right and and new insights about what we can do videographically so the the basic prompt uh, that i came up with was to pair a single film or tv show a single audiovisual text with a single poem or parts of a poem and uh, the way that you combine those is completely up to up to you. That's the prompt I, I put out there into the world for the Moving Poems project. But I'm also, there's some flexibility. I'm also adding videos that engage with poetry um, to, the, to the showcase um, that weren't necessarily made for, for these purposes. Um, and one of the one of the, the key ideas behind it was to see what that would do with language, who would pick it up, um, if any, <laughs> uh, and which languages people would prefer to work in. Uh, we've, over the last few years, we, we've had a lot of conversations about um, language, voiceover, accents in videographic work, um, the, the still very dominant um, use of the English language, uh, et cetera. And so I was just curious if the if poetry, which I tend to think of as perhaps the most intuitive form of writing or, um, or reading, reading text, and perhaps other people have a completely different take on it, um, 
I, I was curious if that would prompt people to work more in their native languages, for example, or if it would even prompt people to write poetry themselves, which it did for me. I didn't really plan on doing that, but I ended up making a few videos based on my own poetry, and I hadn't really written poetry in a long time. So that's the the main idea behind behind the project. So the vi the video that I that I chose for today is by Desiree de Jesus, uh, who found out about the Moving Poems project through Barbara Zeki, as far as I remember. And she picked up the the prompt and paired uh, uh, the the poem Harlem by Langston Hughes with the 1961 film adaptation of A Raisin in the Sun. Um, and this is a very intuitive pairing because the, the, the play A Raisin in the Sun, the title of the play A Raisin in the Sun uh, comes from the Hughes poem. So it's a very clear, uh, there's a very clear connection. Um, it's, not, it's not one of these, these videos that would use the prompt to make make elements clash or you know surprise you with with that pairing and instead she she picked it up to to create a really beautiful poetic meditation on on this connection um both the poem and the play and the film based on the play uh deal with uh with racism in america of roughly about the same time, 1950, early 1950s to early 1960s. I actually find it somewhat challenging to talk about why I picked this, this video, why I like it so much, because it's just one of those videos that I find strikingly beautiful, uh, deeply poetic in, in every way, including the visual poetics. But I have a hard time really expressing what that is on on an academic level, and actually, that perhaps is the most productive way to go about it, uh, and speaks best perhaps to what I wanted to do with the Moving Poems project, which is uh, encourage people to make video essays that pick up poetry that are poetic in and of themselves. And that perhaps um, are are somewhat ineffable in their in their academic um, in their academic meaning, but she the way that she plays with these with, with these different textual elements the the film the play that it's based on the poem uh, and the way that she brings all of those elements in through both spoken word that we hear from from the film and text on screen and then images from the film as well as some very subtle um, added footage um, slow down footage of just of water that is that remains really kind of su subtle and um, and poetic poetically rests on on the videos um, so to speak it's just really haunting and beautiful. And she, one of the things that she does with the text on screen is she she places individual words really carefully on different parts of the frame. Um, she directs, so she directs your attention to different parts of the frame without necessarily um, calling out uh, in, an, in an overly obvious way what to do with with that placement, she enlarges uh, several individual words. So she also inscribes her own interpretation and emphases onto the the source text, uh, and she moves moves that around. There's always you have to you definitely have to watch it several times because there's there are a lot of intricate uh, dynamics at play between the words that we hear and the words that we see on on screen, and it's it's really beautifully done. It it's deeply effective. It uh, it creates an atmosphere of pain, beauty, uh, freedom, both like both oppression, but also the 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 most intense evocation of 
taking a stance through the written word, through the spoken word, um, and through creativity. Um, and, and all of that woven into a web of really deeply poetic uh, images and sounds. I have no better way of, of, of describing it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. Yeah, it's always hard to, like, that's like the one thing about this podcast that's kind of unfair is like we're, you know, taking videos and then trying to like put them back into into words and talk about. So um, we'll def definitely link to this video as well in the description. Um, and before you had um, sent this, actually, I had talked with Desiree, who I got to know at the Middlebury Workshop earlier this year and who is a scholar, but also has a, a YouTube channel. And she does a really interesting range of stuff. And I had talked to her about potentially coming on the podcast in the future. So this would be a rare instance where, you know, we can, the, the, whatever we talk about here, we can hopefully, you know, I'll follow up with Desiree and we'll kind of see what she, what she makes of this. Um, but one thing that's very interesting in, in, in thinking about the, the kind of the moving image poems um, and this one in particular, as you say, this, this kind of rewatchability factor, it, you know, this is a piece you'll want to rewatch it a, several times, just as you say about the beauty, but I think also it's Desiree has structured it in such a way that like, you, you know, you will benefit from, from doing so um, in, in numerous ways. And it's interesting because this video is, is it definitely falls into kind of that epigraphic mode or whatever, but in, in calling attention to maybe something like the TV dictionary or even like the Middlebury epigraph, I think one thing that is stressed in the, scholarship and sound and image workshop, for example, is this idea that the text should be readable in the sense that like we should spend enough time with it to know kind of one sentence to the next as if as if we were kind of reading it in a book. Obviously, people can play with that, subvert it, do interesting things. But I think that that, generally speaking, is the approach that folks take, whereas as Desiree here has kind of um, like the poem, uh, you know, you, you you can read it and I, a lot of people will be familiar with it. It's not a very long poem, um, but the kind of the interplay of the words really, they, they interact all as one, but also as separate kind of entities. And that's with the play of, as you say, the, the dynamic interaction of the text and the image, but also just the, the rhythm of it and how certain words, the font is, is, is larger. Um, and, and I found that to be a, a very effective, um, j yeah, just kind of approach the way that, you know, letters, you know, come off and on to the, to the screen. They, they, they fade in from behind characters. Uh, and they do all these things. So a very, <clears throat> a video that definitely got me, you know, uh, is doing very exciting things with text that I, I hadn't really seen before or, or thought of, which is quite exciting and poetic in its own right. <laughs> Same here. And to be honest, I've always found editing text, uh, in Adobe Premiere, particularly painful, um, and often have avoided doing it, um, or at least I've 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 rarely done anything very experimental in a graphic sense uh, with with text on screen myself. In part because I find it so painful to do in Premiere, um, and also because I tend to use voiceover more. But that is that is something that I that I find really intriguing about the the moving poems project and what people end up doing with it or might do with it in the future um, is to see different ways of, of dealing with text, both on a, on an audio level and on a, on a graphic level. And perhaps um, not surprisingly, or, or perhaps that's, a, that's an interesting side note about the project. Um, I never intended it to be uh, a mass phenomenon. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not that any of, that I intend any of my work to be that, and it's not a mass phenomenon by by any means. Uh, but I'm starting to notice that um, within, I think, not that many people in my usual video essay orbit have picked up the prompt so far. A few have, but not that many. Uh, and I've gotten a few few submissions from people who I didn't know at all beforehand, um, which I didn't necessarily expect. And I'm starting to realize that just by um, by virtue of my of showing my own moving poems, uh, which are all really short, uh, and I usually I've done all of them in a very 
short amount of time uh, that I seem those seem to be, resonate more with my family and friends outside of film study circles uh, than, than my, my usual video essays do. And they've also, I've shown a bunch of them at film festivals so far, which, uh, you know, is still f f non video essay specific film festivals, which I think is, is kind of interesting, perhaps not, not surprising because they, they tend to be more legible as, classic experimental pieces or, or, or video poetry. Um, and I don't know exactly what to do with that yet, but I, it's something that I'll keep observing and I, that I'm curious about. Um, and, and I guess I'll have to see how to interpret that <laughs> or, or what to do with it. That is fascinating. Yeah. And I think Desiree's in particular, like I could imagine in that context and I mean, really resonating like, you know, even out in an academic context outside of film studies, right? Like in a, in a, in a you know, in, in a literature context or something like that. And she does something, you mentioned it earlier, but uh, in the credits, she refers to it, she credits it as, su in the footage section, super slow motion of waving water surface um, by a, a creator, uh, Lucas uh, Gojda. And it's, and it, provides a it's like yeah this kind of super slow motion of waving water surface effect um that is 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 kind of a through line um throughout as she is superimposing different moments from the film or even just letting um a moment from the film play out but provides this very kind of rich foundation that gives a continuity to each um of the images and was also a very a adds this other poetic kind of layer to everything, this incredible richness. Um, um, but again, is also something that I hadn't, I wouldn't, I would never, I, I don't think I've, I don't think I've encountered a work that has like done something uh, like that in, in videographic circles. I'm not saying it's not out there, but for me in watching this was like, whoa, very, um, a very, a very exciting and in a very um, interesting way to kind of provide that that continuity as you're transferring from one image, uh, one image to the next. Yeah, and I, I, I'd be really curious to hear from her, um, hear more from her about what, um, how she came up with that and and what she was thinking of. My first uh, impression or my first thought was uh, the obvious juxtaposition between this water image and the metaphor of the, the title uh, of, of the play and the line in, in, in the Hughes poem, A Raisin in the Sun, right? This, like the, the, driest, the driest image you could think of paired with water is, is kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, I don't know if that was the main impulse be behind that choice, um, but because, because that was my first impulse was to think of that that clashing at the same time as the whole video has such a clear strong flow to it and flow of course also is associated with with water um it made me read the rest of the video through through that through that lens as well that it was almost like her attaching or her inscribing the pain that resonates from all of these other textual elements and the the history that that is that is inscribed into them, especially when we make or watch videos like that now, um, that she puts almost like a I don't know if softness is the right word, but she she adds an element to it that that weaves them all together at the same time as it also puts up a, not a barrier, but an extra layer that, that separates us from, from those sources um, that I think you could, you could do a lot with um, analytically, right? What is, is it, is it an extra layer? Is it her inscribing her creative impetus in there? Is it, mostly an aesthetic choice or is it 
is it's on some level also an element of alienation or a barrier in the way that I just described at the same time as it's part of this smooth flow of, of, an, of a poetic experience. Is it in that sense, perhaps a way to challenge the aesthetic experience that you have, which you could problematize, right? Given the, the subject matter, it's, it's, I'm, this, these are all just open questions that, that, that I have that I'm, I'm, yeah, again, I'd be curious to, to hear her, um, her elaborate on. Yeah. And in, in the, the wave has like, it's for people listening, it's almost like, you know, like if you like kind of, it's, it's not exactly, but it's very similar. It's like, if you were to like, you know, drop a pebble or like a rock in the water, and then it kind of like pushes out and has this like circular effect. And a lot of times in the video that circular effect will center on Sydney Potier's face, especially like in a close up. So it, it's also very much heightening whatever his expression is and his performance um, which I thought, you know, created just an even more, you know, overwhelming and, and, and fantastic effect. So, but yeah, as you say, I'll be interested to hear, uh, hopefully Chow does right at some point and, uh, and yeah, hear what she thinks. Um, to close out here, Evelyn, um, so many other things that um, we could have talked about and asked and, and hopefully will in the future, but for the moving um, poems um, in particular, what is the best, if, if someone's listening here and wants to, to take a stab at it, what's the best way? Um, if someone's listening here and wants to, you know, a, watch more videos and possibly make one um, themselves, what's the best way uh, to get in touch with you? Uh, so the Moving Poems uh, collection is a showcase on Vimeo. That should be really easy to find if you just go on Vimeo and look for Moving Poems or if you just Google Moving Poems Vimeo. Um, you can reach me uh, at media.kreuzer, <laughs> that's K-R-E-U-T-Z-E-R at gmail.com. And I'm always happy to receive contributions to the collection uh, whether it's picking up the exact prompt that I that I posted on the moving poems page or whether it's a video poem that falls outside of that specific prompt but is relevant to the collection overall I'm really excited to see it uh, and I also would be super thrilled if uh, some some of you especially when you teach production classes or perhaps creative writing classes, might consider it as a prompt for your classes as well. Evelyn, thank you so much um, for, for taking the time to talk with us today. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Will. It was a pleasure.